following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio streaming and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for practical advice for everyday problems, using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This week, we're shifting format some because we're going to talk about a serious mental health condition, borderline personality disorder, or BPD. BPD is one of the best known and most stigmatized of what's known as Cluster B conditions, but this is a show about everyday problems, Leanna. What are you doing? Well, for people who live with symptoms of BPD, this is an everyday problem. There are people too. You may know someone with BPD. You may have BPD yourself, or you may see traits in someone or yourself without a diagnosis. My goal here is to help you navigate these situations. This episode, I've got not one, but two interviews, one with a doctor who studies and treats BPD, another with a person who lives with BPD, because I think it's extremely important to humanize something the media tends to sensationalize. Now, the first challenge with borderline personality disorder is the definition. What is it? And this is where words fail us. People with borderline personality disorder experience intense and unstable emotions, moods, and identity that can shift fairly quickly, which manifests as having a hard time calming down once they get upset, angry outbursts, impulsive self-harming behaviors that soothe in the short term, but harm them in the longer term, hence the term disorder. But you're like, well, that... That sounds like something everybody does. Exactly. And that's why I brought in an expert to help us untangle this. So let's get right into it. I'm here with Dr. Daniel LaBelle. He's a specialist on borderline personality disorder. He's written two books, When Your Daughter Has BPT, Essential Skills to Help Families Manage Borderline Personality Disorder, and When Your Mother Has Borderline Personality Disorder, A Guide for Adult Children. Uh, Dan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I've actually written four books, but thank you. Okay, four books. Oh, my goodness. I co-wrote a book uh, with Randy Krager. It's part of the uh, Stop Walking on Eggshells series. And my most recent book is When Your Loved One Has BPD, which was published last year, uh, also on the topic of uh, borderline personality disorder. That's fantastic. Because, yeah, we do sort of stereotype BPD as a woman's mental illness. But, you know, I, I have a friend. He's he's male. He has borderline personality disorder. So uh, what? let's talk first about the diagnosis. What separates borderline personality disorder from, say, bipolar 1 or histrionic personality disorder? Because a diagnosis is not a blood test, right? It's based on a series of symptoms. So how do you get a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? Uh, that's right. Uh, and, and that's a very important point, which which I'm going to speak about just a little bit, uh, uh, that psychiatric diagnosis is not the same as medical diagnosis. The medical diagnosis seeks a very specific cause. It could be a particular bacteria that we can culture for, like, like staph or mm -hmm. strep. It could be a particular kind of cancer that we could determine uh, from a biopsy. Uh, or a structural abnormality that we could observe in, uh, in an MRI or a PET scan. And so the medical diagnoses, by achieving those diagnoses, which are certain because they're based on empirical data, they portend very specific treatments. And that's why the diagnosis is important. In psychiatric diagnosis, we don't have uh, the causal uh, specificity or clarity that we have in medical diagnoses. And so they're clusters of symptoms that we use to define different disorders. Now, within psychiatric diagnosis, there are major categories uh, of disorders uh, that differentiate. So we have, for example, mood disorders uh, would include things like depression, 
Uh, and also, like you say, bipolar, that's a mood disorder. You also have a separate category of anxiety disorders, which would include phobias and uh, general anxiety disorder. And we have thought disorder, which would include schizophrenia uh, and other disorders uh, that uh, have to do with alteration in the way people think, the clarity in, in, in which people think. And then we have the personality disorders. That's a separate category of disorder. And they're characterized uh, by patterns of relating to others uh, as well as the self uh, that are pervasive uh, throughout the person's life in terms of uh, how they deal with others and uh, in also in terms of, of how they conduct themselves uh, around others. Uh, and, and to some extent, not around others, but mostly around others. Because these are pervasive patterns, uh, the diagnosis becomes very complex. And in the, in the DSM, they require observation of the person that you are diagnosing in multiple settings. In other words, uh, you cannot diagnose a personality disorder based on an interview in a doctor's office. And that's where we run into lots and lots of difficulties because doctors don't usually go to people's place of business or their homes uh, or their social groups to observe the behaviors. And yet, without some sort of documentation that these behaviors exist outside of the doctor's office and in multiple settings, the diagnosis is not supposed to be made and should not be made. Wow, that indicates a lot of people are doing it wrong. Unfortunately, that's correct. Specific to the borderline personality disorder, maybe some of the others too, but especially with, with borderline, again, making the diagnosis very difficult, is that in non-intimate settings, people with borderline personality disorder often appear to have no disorder at all. They are capable in casual settings. People who suffer from this disorder are capable frequently capable, particularly if they're smart, and a lot of them are very intelligent, mm -hmm. uh, they're able to conduct themselves with good manners and appropriate behavior at work uh, or in other settings that uh, are not intimate. And then when they get into intimate relationships where there is uh, the issue of need fulfillment, then the behavior is completely different. So that's a marker of borderline personality disorders it comes out in around people they essentially love and trust uh that's right right that's right people that they rely on uh for their either emotional or or pragmatic functioning right and is that what you're describing i've seen that with some people who have bpd they call that the camouflage effect or the chameleon effect is that what you're referring to that's right. A better description of that for clinical purposes uh, is instability. And the borderline, whereas other personality disorders, for example, the narcissistic personality disorder, or as you brought up, the histrionic personality disorder, they're actually fairly stable disorders. They're not acting in a good place, but a person who's narcissistic, they don't ever uh, or very rarely uh, display empathy. They, they almost always uh, aggrandize themselves and put themselves first and focus on the, the self and, and, and their own needs uh, often to the, to the uh, detriment or, or to the uh, missing out of other people's. The borderline personality disorder, we see unstable functioning so that they mm -hmm. act in different places and at different times. Now, let me make sure I have this correct. Someone with borderline personality disorder, their feelings are very raw. Yes, that's, that's, I would say that's almost always the case. Uh, but it's, it's also the expression of those feelings that's unstable and very often unmodulated. In other words, uh, they, they, uh, the feelings uh, come to the mouth without, uh, without any uh, buffering uh, or scrutiny. You know, very often... Like for example, if if we go if we're visiting with a friend and and uh, they you know re redecorate their home and we think that they've done an atrocious job, mm -hmm. we may choose, we may choose not to share that 
in the interest of, of not hurting the person's feelings and saying, oh, yes, it looks nice, you know, rather than saying, oh, my gosh, you know, you've redecorated your house and you've turned it into something horrible. We, we probably would choose not to say that. The, there's an absence of modulation uh, with, uh, with, with the people who have borderline features and, and also in some other uh, uh, diagnostic categories, because that's a function of impulsivity. The, the, okay. the uh, lack of uh, modulation or screening or buffering of verbal behavior and other kinds of behavior. But impulsivity is not specific to the borderline. It's one of the overlapping symptoms. You'll see it in ADHD. You would see it in bipolar disorder, particularly people who are in the manic phase of, of bipolar. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's probably a point to let people stop and digest for a few minutes before we do a deep dive. Dr. Daniel Lobel, specialist on BPD, talking about separating myth from fact, how to work with love, cherish, and respect people with this condition, especially if you have it on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. We're still going to be talking about this in very human terms when we come back after this break in a few minutes. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy talking about borderline personality disorder with my first guest of two for the evening, Dr. Daniel Lobel, specialist on BPD. Now, before the break, we were talking about the idea of instability and how that's a specific thing that is one of the traits of borderline personality disorder that we don't see in other personality disorders. And Dr. Dan wanted to drill down on this. So that's where we're going to pick up specifically instability in borderline personality disorder. Uh, I think we can focus on three spheres of uh, instability that are really defining uh, of the BPD and all the other symptoms come from these three areas of instability. One is the, the mood is unstable. And so they can be, uh, uh, you we use the term euthymic, which essentially just means in a good mood. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they hear something that sort of rubs them the wrong way, they may lash out instantly and immediately uh, rise to aggression uh, or, or to, or they may leave. They may say, "I'm out of here," you know, without any kind of discussion. And and so there is the instability of mood, and related to that is the instability of relationships. People come and go; they don't have a long-term relationships. And a somebody recently was telling me about their child, uh, who a friend of the child had said to her, uh, "You know, I have to end this friendship because I, I can't." Uh, I can't take the ups and downs anymore. I can't apologize all the time and I can't take the ups and downs anymore. And so they essentially ended the relationship because it was so unstable. And the insta instability in, within the relationship produces anxiety in others because they don't know what to expect. But there is the third sphere of instability uh, that is very important, I think, for people to understand which is that people with a borderline personality disorder or significant features of borderline personality disorder, they also have an unstable sense of themselves. And that's why uh, they, a lot of the unstable behavior that we'll be talking about in a moment comes from the unstable sense of self, where at times they are, sort of look almost like narcissists mm -hmm. in that about how they have to be right, they're always right, they're never wrong. They don't take responsibility, but underlying uh, that sense of grandiosity is a deeper sense of self-loathing and a fear that they're broken. And that's why they don't, they're very resistant to taking responsibility if they've made an error, hmm. because an error is not just an error. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot your birthday. No, it's a flaw. And it reveals a whole host of flaws that they perceive in themselves and don't want others to see. Right. And and that's where we get to the the lashing out the accusations it, based on what you just said. It's a defense mechanism. Is that right? Yes. So, yes, it's very important to, to understand that, because uh, uh, if 
you uh, criticize or blame someone with features of borderline personality disorder, particularly if you uh, don't do it very carefully, but even if you do, uh, that's often perceived as an attack. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a constructive criticism, like I like the green shirt better than the blue one uh, that you're wearing today. I like the green shirt you wore yesterday better than the blue one. Oh, you don't like what I'm wearing? No, I didn't say, well, you think I don't have good taste? No, I didn't say that. I just like the green shirt. And you have these conversations that spiral into lashing out and, and can actually get very aggressive. And that'll take us into a conversation about uh, one of the symptoms they experience called dissociation, mm -hmm. where they, particularly during uh, agitated and aggressive uh, uh, periods, uh, they lose self-awareness. Um, and, and so they're not, they're often not aware of how aggressive they are or, or, or even the fact that they're pushing people away when they're very clearly pushing people away. And then later on, they'll wonder, gee, why doesn't, why isn't this person my friend anymore? Yeah. And that's what makes this so challenging, right? Because everybody does that sometimes. Is it the frequency, the extremity of it, the inability to reflect after the fact or all of the above that pushes it into disorder? Well, the 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 dissociation is is a transient state. Uh, and in it, it, there's a very large percentage of people with borderline personality disorder who have some sort of trauma. Uh, and, and so it causes a state of, of uh, decreased awareness. Uh, but even during non, non dissociative states, they're highly defensive, which makes it very, very difficult for them to accept any feedback other than you're wonderful. And does that tie into the other phenomenon you see colloquially with borderline, the idea of de-pedestaling or splitting? Yes. Well, the, the, the pedestaling or uh, what, what we refer to clinically as idealization uh, which also is uh, paired with the opposite of that, which is devaluation, uh, relates to the instability, as I said, which is the cornerstone of this disorder. And so part of the instability is caused by them seeing things largely in black and white terms and having difficulty seeing gray areas. And so what they do is they put people up on a pedestal uh, in the hope that the person will fulfill all their needs. Uh, this person's great. This is the best, per you know, best, best boyfriend, best girlfriend, best teacher, best this, best that. But that almost always leads to a disappointment because nobody can sustain an idealized way of relating to anything or anybody. Humans are just not capable of that. And so when the disappointment comes, they very, very quickly become the worst. They go from best to worst very, very quickly, instantaneously actually, which parallels what I was speaking about before, which is the instability of the self. Mm -hmm. So they see themselves as the best until they see an error and then they become the worst. And that's where you start to see other symptoms like the self injurious behavior, the cutting of the self and other kinds of self-sabotaging and self-destructive behaviors, uh, including suicidal ideation and sometimes suicidal behaviors that, that uh, uh, emanate from that shift uh, from uh, the self, the idealization of the self to the devaluation of the self. And then that also gets projected onto others as well. Right, because it comes down to identity and we talk identity to death these days, but the understanding of it is so poor, right? It's not a collection of adjectives we call ourselves. It's the, the understanding of who we are where we end the world begins and vice versa. So how does someone, how do you start treating this condition? Because there's so many things, you know, there's the behaviors and then there's the daily functioning, but then there's that deep identity work. Where do you start? It's, uh, you're right. It's, it's very, very difficult and it's very uh, complex. And, and so, uh, you, the, in my opinion, uh, the, you have to start with first creating a safe uh, place uh, for, the, for the person to be able to express themselves and explore themselves. And the safety 
uh, to go back to your question before, mm -hmm. is produced through validation. And uh, so when you validate someone with symptoms of VPD or anybody for that matter, you can validate a person's feelings without agreeing with those feelings. You can validate a person's feelings without agreeing with the events that they claim produce those feelings, simply by focusing just on validating the feelings. So if someone's angry, which is a lot of what you may see, you can say to the person, I see that you're very angry. That doesn't mean I agree with you being angry. That doesn't mean that I agree that I made you angry. I'm just saying, I see that you're angry. Right. And when, when validating this particular emotion, I believe, and, and have written a lot about this, that people always get angry for the same reason. I know that's a strong statement, but <laughs> the, the reason people get angry is because they're hurt. And then I will encourage them to speak about the hurt rather than the anger, because speaking about anger, yelling at people and saying nasty things to people pushes them away. But talking about the underlying hurt does not push people away. And so if they can start to talk about what's hurting them the, uh, and address what's hurting them, the anger will naturally dissipate once the hurt stops. Uh, the second step in the treatment uh, of this personality disorder is you have to, you have to be able to uh, help the person cope with the instability and you have to create stability instead. And so a stable personality is achieved through stable behavior. If you believe that uh, boundaries, for example, are good and healthy, then you have to uh, uh, observe boundaries even when it's not convenient to do so. <laughs> yep. I say on this show, one of my top 10 phrases is people don't have to like your boundaries, but they do have to respect them. And they'll, they'll even say it. Uh, many of the people uh, will say, you know, uh, I understand that you said, for example, I understand that your boundary is not to not to text you in the middle of the night, but I was really upset. Mm -hmm. So I did it anyway. Not have stability in yourself if you're going to behave that way. If you know that that's a boundary, I understand you would like to talk to me in the middle of the night, but you have we have agreed on that boundary and you're now breaking it. If I allow that to occur, that's unstable. Stability and consistency. Okay, so it's actually a bad thing to quote unquote be nice and let them do it every so often because that's not consistent. That's right. Right. Rather than that, uh, the therapist should instead say, I understand that it's very hard for you when you're feeling badly and you rely on me to not be able to reach me at certain times that are very difficult for you. Let's talk about something that we could work out that will work for both of us. So number one would be, do not be defensive. Number two, and this is extremely important, is that the therapist must model the behavior uh, and not only the behavior, but the consistency of behavior that uh, the, the therapist hopes to convey to the, to the person who's trying to find stability, health and stability. And that means that the therapist, when the therapist makes an error, should apologize. Mm -hmm. Yes, I made an error. No, you may not beat me up. Because you're modeling it being safe to make a mistake without the bottom falling out. Exactly. That makes complete sense. All right, Dr. Daniel Lobel, thank you so much. Check out uh, Dr. Daniel's books. There are four of them, not two, as I said off the top. That was my mistake. I also have my own website, which is mysideofthecouch.com. And I'm currently in negotiation of my fifth book. Congratulations, well-deserved. When we come back, we're going to pivot to a first-person view. We're going to talk to a friend of mine who has borderline personality disorder. So we're going to find out what it's like from the inside, so to speak. You're not going to want to miss that. Hang on. After the break, I'm still Leanna Kirsner. I'm still not a therapist. We're still talking borderline personality disorder, living and loving someone with the condition. Stay tuned. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca.
We're back on It's Not Therapy. We're talking living and loving someone with borderline personality disorder. And you may remember back when we did the Bubbleheads episode, Mary just mentioned being close to somebody with a mental illness. And I have that person. I have Mary Jess' husband, Asher, with me for this show. And Asher has, well, Asher, what do you prefer? You have borderline personality disorder or you exhibit symptoms of borderline personality disorder? I would say I have borderline personality disorder. Okay. I'm kind of lucky in a way that, you know, my label, because so many military veterans have it, they strip out the D in right. in room. So it's PTS, not PTSD. And it's sort of like, well, can we do that for other things? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I understand you have to put the disorder into it because it's negatively affecting your life. But we're, right. you, you know, we're, as I say, we're putting people in the no box or the bad right. box instead right. of starting with a condition to help people live their best lives. Right. And this is why I like talking to people, especially with conditions like yours that are the psycho chick in the movie that the main character in the 80s and 90s cheats on his you know, perfect but boring wife with, and then that's the plot because she's psycho. I mean, that's how most people understand borderline personality disorder, right? right? What is your experience? How do you connect with this reality? It is, it's something I have, it's something I exhibit. And I think it, to me, to me, I think in a sense, it does speak to the construction of my psyche. Mm -hmm. I don't think I am a borderline person. Like that's not my identity any more than being gay is my identity. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think to myself, I am a gay person. Thus, that's my, my identity. Does that make sense? Totally. So, I, yeah. So totally. to me, yeah. yeah, no, I know, but I know people like I've had a boyfriend whose gay, gayness was their identity. And I thought that's interesting to me. <laughs> so to me, it's just a facet. And so in that sense, that's how I regard it. It's just a facet of, it's a description in my, in my view, it's an outsider's description of something I might do and yeah. to me, or something that might be bothering me or something that maybe I can be aware of and, 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 and change for the better. When I was, I was diagnosed when I was 18 okay. and I was diagnosed because um, I attempted suicide at uh, when I attended university, uh, about six weeks in, I was so racked with problems. I had problems with the curriculum. I was struggling. And the first time in my life academically, I was very much struggling. Mm -hmm. I was struggling con have, having any real contact with new people, meeting new people, making friends. I was really struggling. And I would call my mom up on pay phones. That's how long ago this was. Mm. I would call my mom up on pay phones and just have cry sessions. And I would just cry. And I did that because I didn't want my roommate to hear me on the phone mm -hmm. talking to my mom because there were no cell phones. Right. And it was after I had a terrible conversation with my roommate's friend that was also my brother-in-law's roommate because it was all connected. Mm -hmm. And... He had a very narrow-minded, very nihilistic, very re repulsive to me at the time worldview that he told me all about. And right after that, I attempted suicide. So I wake up the next morning and I'm like, oh, I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what to do. Thought I would need to rectify this. Ended up getting caught, in essence, by a TA that I had contacted the <laughs> night before and ended up in the Boulder Behavioral Science Center. Mm -hmm. And long story short, at 18, um, Dr. Mo at the Boulder Behavioral Science Center, who was fine, but he also had issues too, because Dr. Mo called me a candy. What? 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 I, that's what he called me. And I asked him what he went, meant by that. And I think what he was picking up on, he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no. <laughs> but what I think he was picking up on was that I was from a small town and absolutely not prepared for a city whatsoever. But basically, Dr. Mo told my mother on the phone, much mm -hmm. more professional terms, um, that he, he thought I had borderline personality disorder. Okay. And she said, well, what does that mean? He basically said, and this at this time, this was the literature, because this was 2001. 
And he said, it means that he's probably going to have a lifetime of hospitalizations and issues. Sadly enough, he wasn't entirely wrong mm -hmm. because um, I have been hospitalized a lot. Mm -hmm. As an adult, I, have been ho I haven't been hospitalized in a long time. I haven't been hospitalized since COVID, the pandemic, which is great. I have a sense of humor about the whole thing, which mm -hmm. really helps. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, I have been hospitalized 16 times. Mm -hmm. And so it's always kind of funny to me when I get into the hospital and somebody will be there and it'll be their first time and they just rode in a police car. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask me, like, and I'll say, oh, yeah, that that's pretty common. They go, how many times have you been here? I'm like, this is my 17th. And they're yeah. like, oh. <laughs> yeah. so, it really is lousy that the interventions happen so late instead oh, of, yeah. and, and it's partially because, you know, you're in the U S the way the system works, you need a diagnosis so you can get medically necessary treatment instead of medically recommended treatment, which yeah. is okay. Let's try this and see if it helps. There's no blood test for, a, a mood disorder. Or a, I hate the term personality disorder because you have a wonderful personality. You're awesome. There's just something going on. It's on the identity level. Oh, yes. See, here's here's an interesting thing to me, and I can see this in retrospect. I'm 40 now, so I'm in mm -hmm. way in retrospect. Other diagnoses that, that people have toyed with with me as well is bipolar type 2, um, they've also thought about um, major depression, which is duh, but <laughs> mm -hmm. they've also thought um, obsessive compulsive disorder. But when I look back on my arguments, on my relationships, on the things, on the on the way I would treat people, the way people would treat me, mm -hmm. it would when, when I hear borderline personality disorder. I don't think the word disorder to me doesn't speak about me being disordered. I think of it as basically my life being disordered. Right. I've learned over 20 years to kind of curb or really think about my impulses, think mm -hmm. about how I want to deal with people in relationships, catch myself before I do certain things because I've run into problems in my life mm -hmm. of, I'll meet somebody, they'll be my bestie, we'll have instant intimacy, and I mean that in a very broad term, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we'll be, we'll suddenly be wonderful friends, and it's like, I've known them for maybe a week. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, that insta bestie. Thing, oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. really common in, but, you know, every so often you do meet somebody who is just, why haven't I known you my entire life? So that's oh, yeah. not the problem. The no. problem is what comes next, right? It's when that doesn't hold. Right. Right. And then, and this is where we get into that identity piece. And I really, if we can walk away with one thing from this, I want people to have a sense of what that instability is like that everything's amazing and then everything's awful and because somebody sitting here listening right now is okay one bad conversation and you ended up in a suicide attempt obviously that's not the complete story there was a lot going on under the surface mm -hmm. so what's it without triggering you <laughs> how how do you describe how it's like to someone to be in that state you just you described it to me once as you know you're making no sense but it feels so real i've literally had therapists or other people look at me and say okay so you had a like just like you said so you had mm -hmm. a bad conversation and boom you kill yourself and i'm like well yeah if you want to paint it like that <laughs> what will happen when people talk about instability of identity, when people talk about instability of emotions, instability of mood, mm -hmm. to most people, from what I can tell, because I have no idea what a normal person is, right. because because honestly, borderline behaviors are basically, it's like a water to fish. To mm -hmm. me, it all makes sense. I really don't have the best reference for what a quote unquote and I even question if this is even real, but what a quote unquote normal person does, I have no reference. So 
I only know what other people tell me. Mm -hmm. So from what I can gather, what was supposed to happen or what would normal, what would happen to a, to a stable person is they'd have this terrible conversation with this person and they'd feel low or they'd be like, wow, that's, that's really sh and they'd either reject it or they'd mm -hmm. ponder on it or they'd real or they'd think, wow, I'm glad I'm not like him. That's not what I did. Mm -hmm. I had this really conversation with this person and I went, entered into this weird dysphoria where it was almost as if everything was moving so fast. I was every emotion and because I couldn't think straight, everything he said became my world. His, instead of thinking, wow, he's cra he's a crappy person. I don't want to be like him. I thought, wow, he's a crappy person. The whole world is like that. I must be Ron. I must be like that. I am that person. The world is that way. And all of a sudden I'm wandering around the engineering center, completely whacked out, having no identity, like no, no reference point whatsoever. I'm in a sea, a sea of emotions. I can't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to make of the world. And I finally realize, or I think to myself, well, if that's the way the world is, I'm just going to kill myself. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. That and, one little thing you can control. Yeah. Cause at yeah. that point, my existence is literally the only thing I can control. That's right. That that's so much like PTS. And I hate to say this because it, but this is just me. This is just my personal thing. If mm -hmm. I could package up dysphoria, yeah. if I could point to one thing and say, this is an expression of someone experiencing dysphoria, mm -hmm. it would be nine inch nails. Oh, oh wow. Was, what the, the downward was, spiral, that album? Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I was yeah, a I huge, that. I was a huge, huge, huge fan as a teenager. Me but too. if you really look at it and you think about it, like, and, and it's interesting to me because it's very much like BPD. People have this weird interpretation that skips over things. The the song Closer, mm -hmm. Closer is not about, in my opinion, Closer is not about being a wild animal that wants to have sex. No, 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 no. Closer. No, no. Oh, my shit. whole existence is flawed. You get oh, me closer yeah. to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about, it's about so much. Mm -hmm. And if I could point to something, it would literally be um, the video, the music videos for Closer happiness and slavery for sure which has been banned and isn't a, around a lot of places really? I, have, I have a copy of it and um um what's another what's one of the other songs or, I mean, or, like, uh, or I the mean, perfect drug oh that wasn't off that particular album but yeah that came later oh. didn't it oh yeah okay asher hang on this is a good place to pause and go to break before we get to the next chunk of conversation. I'm here with Asher, who has borderline personality disorder. We're talking about what it's like to have BPD separating myth from reality on It's Not Therapy. We'll be back with more after this break. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy, our final minutes on It's Not Therapy, talking borderline personality disorder, separating myth from reality. And I'm here with Asher, who has borderline personality disorder. And Asher's been talking to us about what his journey's been like. Now, another thing on that, on that note, because this is where we get into the practical advice part of the program, which is the mandate, because this is not therapy. Uh, yeah. When you have a episode, for lack of a better term, you know, I call it getting tossed into the underworld because that that's it for me. Those levels where Kratos is climbing out of the underworld and God of War and all the hands are coming to the walls, grabbing at him. I'm like, that's it. That's what it's <laughs> like what helps? What can people do so that, you know, first of all, what do you want them to know? And second of all, what works or or works less badly? Um, when I think about my lowest, lowest, lowest of the low, in the hole, totally despondent, totally dysphoric, completely whacked out, mm -hmm. to be honest, the thing, the one thing that, that's probably helped the most at those times was hospitalization. Right. And I think that people, um, and I get it, nobody wants to be caged, but people there's groups of people that paint this my biggest 
to be honest, my biggest fear of going into a hospital is that they'll change my meds. Right. But that's, but that's it. That's it. Because it's people paint it as this horrible, horrible thing. And it can be. But in my experience, it's really a safe place most of the time to just decompress, restabilize. But you can't do that all the time. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But I mean, I think that's why John Fetterman doing it was so important. Because when a US senator can check himself in for a few weeks, it it takes that sense that it's, oh, you know, because then people think they have to tiptoe around and all that stuff. And no. yeah, yeah, you don't want people doing that, right? Not really, because I think it reinforces there's this there's this. Um, I don't want to call it a stereotype, because it's kind of true but there's this idea of always walking on eggshells around borderlines yeah and I don't my biggest thing is I don't want to have I don't want anything to reinforce the feeling that you're walking on eggshells around a borderline person even mm -hmm. though that's, I'm sure that's exactly how it feels but I don't want to reinforce that in any way yeah so no it, it's to it, me it, it's not helpful when people tiptoe around it 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 takes a bit of training to recognize, okay, you know, something I said or something I did had an effect, but that doesn't mean it was wrong. This is just something that we have to get through. Oh, yeah. My biggest cope, to be honest, is I've learned over time to just not to not act. It's become almost second like nature, really. But to me, once my emotions and this is the thing I don't think people realize about borderlines is that a border it is it is shown my my husband showed me a study I mean in a book yeah, and things yeah, yeah. that borderlines experience emotions oftentimes not every emotion but they experience emotions oftentimes much more severely mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily make them special it's just it's so so strong and when you get into a space where all the limits are off, there's absolute, there's nothing regulating anything, any of your yeah. emotions. I've learned because when I have acted, it's ended up in unaliving. Right. And so I've kind of learned to shut completely down and I turn inward completely. And that, maybe that's good. Maybe it isn't, but it keeps me from doing things. I, no. I prevent myself from doing things like I'll, I'll think to myself, God, I just want to, you know, I just want to bang my head against the wall. I just want right. to take over meds. I just want to stab something with an eye. Oh, I'm going to, but I don't do it. Yeah. It's the part it of just, your brain that do something part of your brain kicking in. It's an amygdala right. hijack. Yeah. And you're doing the right thing. But I just, I just stop. Right. I just stop acting at all. And yep. I, I think it, and I really want to do it, but I've told myself don't do anything. And I basically, mm -hmm. I just wait until the whole thing, because in my experience, it used to not be like this, because I used to not be able to see any end to the tunnel. Yeah. But every time, almost every time, and my mom would point it out, every time she'd say, see, see, it, it, you, you, it, it calmed down, it, it, you gained some perspective. My biggest thing is it's all mental. In my mind, my biggest antidote to all of, to lots of freaking out and emotions and everything else is perspective. Yeah, yeah. If I can frame things in a better perspective, if I can see things from a better, better distance, that's why I've actually mm -hmm. done ketamine. I've done ketamine therapy mm -hmm. and ketamine gives you an incredible amount of perspective. And that's my go-to. If I'm having a problem, if I'm freaking out, if I'm having tunnel vision thoughts, because that's how I describe it. Okay. It's like your, your thoughts become facts of the world. It's right. almost like they're not your thoughts anymore. They are the world. And yeah. the biggest antidote to any of that is for some people, they have to do something physical. They need to ground themselves. They need to breathe. They need to hold a stone. They need to hold an ice cube. They need to do, I've heard lots of things, but to me, the biggest thing that can slow me mentally is either is me thinking about trying to gain perspective mm -hmm. or someone like my husband coming along and verbally saying, look, you've lost perspective. Here's some perspective. And I go, oh, <laughs> right. my biggest problem when I was younger and I was first diagnosed with borderline and I kept ending up in the hospital was the fact that that didn't exist for me at all. That wasn't a concept. 
Mm -hmm. I would go, I would get put into an extreme situation where everything would go to the extreme. Right. And I wouldn't think to myself, this is too extreme. I think this is the world. Yes. It wasn't until I learned to do that. My hospitalizations decreased. Mm -hmm. I could go longer and farther. I could deal with more situations. Once I learned that simple thing, I was like, so yeah, that's where my top 10 phrase, don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are came from. It's what I tell myself when something's hitting me and yep. I feel the need to go Kratos. It's like, don't, don't, don't smash that thing. You know, yep. like don't, this isn't your problem. This is either the world's problem. This is somebody else's problem. Don't let this problem that isn't you become a mistake that is. Yeah. And I just say that to myself <laughs> over and over and over. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't push the red button. Right. And it it sounds kind of stupid. You know, the catchphrase is people roll their eyes and go, oh, this is some self-help thing. No, this is this is what I found worked. Yeah. This is my take on, you know, DBT mindfulness. The best thing I think someone suffering from borderline can can benefit from. And I know it gets so hokey. I know. I'm an intelligent guy. I I am very cerebral and I, I know. But the, I think the biggest thing is to learn some level of, dis- and it's, these are the key words, distress tolerance. Mm-hmm. Because I think most borderlines get into the most trouble in my experience from myself, other people I've known that were borderline, like I'm saying met in the hospital, is they, is they don't know how to tolerate distress and that's where everything goes to Mm -hmm. and that's actually something i wanted to touch on the stereotypes of borderline that get portrayed in the media particularly like in the 90s and all these films is what i don't think people realize and it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have boundaries and set limits and tell the borderline person hey you're you're going too far all of that you should do but i think they fail to realize sometimes the borderline person is in distress Mm -hmm. they are hurting they are a person maybe their behaviors suck maybe their behaviors are awful but they are that and it doesn't excuse it but they're they at the core they are hurting Mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do i really appreciate you doing this i knew you'd be great anything you want to drive people to do you got a website or something like that you want somebody to have a look at if you go to wunk.me, W-U-N-K.me, and click on archive, you will find a website that has lots of material of me over the years. And you can kind of, if you read through it, which for whatever, you can kind of actually see me evolve. You can you can see me in the throes of it, and then you can see me kind of gradually get better. And with that, we're out of time. Asher, thank you for being on It's Not Therapy. This is the end of our Borderline Personality Disorder episode. Remember... Your crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you.